Hi class. Okay, so we just talked about caring for clients with upper GI disorders and now we're going to go into caring for the client with lower GI disorders. So here are those fun learning objectives that I know you all take and study from. And this is our agenda for today. So we're going to be talking about gastritis peptic ulcer disease, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac, acute versus non-acute abdomen, diverticulitis versus diverticulosis, bowel obstruction, ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease, and ostomy care, and anorectal disorder. So we're going to be talking about a lot of topics, um, but stick with me here. Um, it shouldn't take too long. So when we're thinking about the lower GI tract, we want to um, have in our heads, well, what is the lower G GI tract responsible for and what are we most concerned about if that is malfunctioning? Um, so we know that our client's nutritional status doesn't only depend on the amount of intake they're getting, but also how well their stomach and their GI system is functioning. So thinking about the concerns you might have um, that I've listed um, in order to prioritize your care is really going to be important here. So let's start with gastritis, which is inflammation of the gastric and stomach mucosa. So that lining in your stomach. And this is a common GI disorder and it can be acute where it lasts for a few days or it can be chronic, which results from repeated exposure to irritating agents or recurring episodes of acute gastritis. And it can be classified as erosive or non-erosive. Um, as in it's eating away at that lining, that mucosa of the stomach, and it's causing bigger issues. So erosive forms of gastritis typically result from local irritants such as aspirin or NSAIDs, sometimes corticosteroids, alcohol, um, gastric radiation therapy. Um, if our client is receiving um, radiation for gastric cancer, um, or then you have a non-erosive gastritis and it's often caused by an infection where the client will have um, what we will talk about um, helicobacter pylori, H. pylori, um, and this is a spiral shaped gram negative bacteria and it can cause chronic gastritis and then lead to peptic ulcers, gastric adenocarcinoma, which is a cancer, and then lymphoma. So gastritis can also develop in um, acute illness, also major traumatic injuries, burns, stress, severe infections, or major surgery. And there's um, really a lack of perfusion to that lining of the stomach when, this, um, when these other um, situations occur. So clinical manifestations for the client with acute gastritis this includes rapid onset of epigastric pain or discomfort, dyspepsia, anorexia, hiccups, nausea, vomiting. Um, and this can last again for a few hours to a few days. Um, in erosive gastritis, we may see bleeding, which can be um, a client may be vomiting blood or melana or hematic, um, hematico Chesia, which is bright red bloody stools. Um, the client with chronic gastritis may complain of pyrosis after eating, may have some belching, a sour taste in their mouth, halitosis, early sati, um, anorexia, and then nausea vomiting. Or sometimes um, clients with chronic gastritis end up having no symptoms. Um, but they definitely have absorption issues. So for instance, someone with chronic gastritis may not be able to absorb vitamin B12 and they may end up having pernicious anemia because of the diminished production of intrinsic factor to absorb that vitamin, which we'll talk about um, later on in the semester. But that's something to think about. Um, <clears throat> and then diagnostic. So, a definitive diagnosis of gastritis is really determined by endoscopy and then examination of a tissue specimen via biopsy. 
Um, provider may also order a CBC um, to assess for anemia. And then they will probably be testing for that bacteria H. pylori. Um, so medical management of gastritis, typically um, gas the gastric mucosa can go ahead and repair itself with rest from those substances that are causing irritation. So um, the provider may say if alcohol is inducing the gastritis, please refrain from using that. Um, maybe, again, it's from a, an acute um, infection. Um, maybe they will require some antibiotics and some bowel rest. Um, so we most likely will be asking them to maintain an NPO status um, because food and drink is going to cause that release of gastric acid, which is going to make that gastritis worse. Um, and then the pain is going to be worse. So we would just really want that stomach to rest. Um, sometimes clients may be given IV fluids while maintaining that NPO status just to give them some hydration. Um, we can also give medications like antacids, histamine 2 receptor antagonists, and proton pump inhibitors. And that's really just to help reduce hydrochloric acid or neutralize it. And then nursing considerations, we want to reduce any anxiety just in case um, this is emergent um, and they might need um, emergency management um, because remember gastritis can lead to complications like perforation, which would then require emergent surgery. So um, maintaining a calm approach and making sure to answer any questions the client may have about the procedures being performed then promoting optimal nutrition, um, because remember they might have issues with absorption. Um, and obviously the client will be NPO, but um, they may be on IV fluids, so measuring intake and output, um, making sure that the IV site is free of infections. Um, and then as soon as the client is able to tolerate food, just educating about foods to avoid, symptoms to report, um, avoiding alcohol, cigarettes, um, promoting fluid balance, watching those electrolytes, looking for signs of dehydration, so things like tachycardia and hypotension, managing their pain, um, and then administering medications like we discussed that lower, lower that hydrochloric acid production. So this is a picture of what gastritis might look like. Um, the picture on the right is, or the picture on the left is an, an endoscopy and the lining of that stomach, which looks angry red with some scarring. So see those whitish yellow spots? Um, and then the picture on the right is showing that damaged mucosa. So that was gastritis, and now we're on to peptic ulcer disease, which is also very common, and it affects about 4.6 million Americans annually, um, with the peak onset being between the ages of 30 and 60. <clears throat> so there's different types of peptic ulcers. There's gastric, duodenal, or esophageal, and this is really dependent on the location of the ulcer. Um, so what's a peptic ulcer? Well, it's really a hollowed out area that forms in the mucosa of the stomach and it really can extend pretty deeply into all the layers of the stomach um, to the peritoneum, which separates our stomach from other organs in our, our abdominal cavity. Um, so we don't want that. Um, and maybe you can picture why that would be a problem. Um, so most of the time when you have a peptic ulcer, um, you will have multiple ulcers. Um, and the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease is what we talked about in the last couple of slides, which is that pesky bacteria, H. pylori, um, which is acquired by ingestion of food and water, and it's transmitted from person to person through either close contact or exposure to their emesis um, with that bacteria. Um, but H. pylori, it doesn't always impact someone with peptic ulcer disease, um, and that information is really not known yet. Um, but 
Other risk factors include for peptic ulcer disease is stress, like you and me right now, um, smoking, NSAIDs, and alcohol use. Clinical manifestations, um, these may last for a few days, weeks, or even months, and they may disappear and then reappear again. So going into remissions with exacerbations, and sometimes without any identifiable cause. Um, many patients with peptic ulcer disease have no signs and symptoms, and these silent peptic ulcers most commonly occur in older adults and those who are taking like aspirin and other NSAIDs until they come in with a GI bleed. Um, but generally, when clients do have symptoms, they will complain of a dull gnawing pain or a burning sensation in the mid-epigastric um, mid region or the back area. And they might also say that they have heartburn, constipation, and diarrhea. And then, of course, we want to look for GI bleed or melena, melena, sorry. Um, and with duodenal ulcers, it's a different kind of pain um, because it's lower in our stomach, clients might complain of pain two to three hours after eating. So assessment and diagnostics, overall a history and physical um, are gonna be done. And we're looking for any signs and symptoms of bleeding or perforation, which can result um, in peritonitis and sepsis and death. So watching out for that, looking at labs, um, looking at their hemoglobin and hematocrit hematocrit for their blood cell count. Um, they might end up doing an endoscopy, maybe biopsying that tissue and determining whether or not it's H. pylori. So here's a great slide on clinical manifestations of the different types of ulcers and um, note the difference between the duodenal and the gastric ulcers. And here's a picture um, endosc um, with the endoscopy um, of a duodenal ulcer versus a gastric ulcer for my visual learners. And then we'll talk about the pharmacological management for peptic ulcer disease. So really, um, since majority of the time H. pylori is the culprit, um, we really want to eradicate that and manage the gastric acidity. So the provider will either place the client on triple therapy or quadruple therapy. So triple therapy includes metronidazole or amoxicillin plus clarithromycin. So all antibiotics, um, plus a proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole or pantoprazole. And then quad therapy would be the addition of um, bismuth salicate um, or peptobismol as we know it. So if this isn't H. pylori, then we would place the client on a proton pump inhibitor and an H2 blocker. And they may also add antacids and sulcrophate for those at risk for increased bleeding. And you'll wanna tell these clients, especially the ones on metronidazole, not to drink any alcohol, not even one drop um, because of the toxic effects that it can have um, interacting with this antibiotic. Um, you wanna also avoid caffeine and coffee. So if this management doesn't work, then we go to the big guns, which is surgical intervention, a vagotomy, um, pyloroplasty, or antrectomy, which are procedures to decrease gastric acid secretion. Um, these have a lot of complications, um, such as infection and bleeding, as with any surgery, um, issues with nutrition, um, but the one I want you to pay attention to is dumping syndrome, which we will talk about um, on the next slide. So dumping syndrome is a condition in which food, especially food high in sugar, moves from your stomach into your small bowel way too quickly after you eat. And the clients who had recent gastric surgery, like a Bill Roth procedure, these are um, clients that are at increased risk of this occurring. So symptoms to look out for are weakness, 
dizziness, diaphoresis about 15 to 30 minutes after they're eating. Um, and in order to prevent this from occurring, which is something that as nurses we want to um, discuss with our clients um, right after surgery before they're starting to eat, is um, we recommend um, that they eat with no liquids with their meals and no high carbohydrate foods like sweets, bread, potatoes, um, etc. Okay, so then next thing in chapter 41 of your book, it covers constipation, diarrhea, and fecal incontinence. Which I think you're, which I think are straightforward enough for you all to go ahead and review on your own. Um, you'll have to just bring it forward from Adult Health One. Things like just recognizing the importance of establishing like a bowel routine for some of your clients, a proper dietary habits like increasing fiber, fruits, vegetables, hydration, increasing abdominal muscle strength, using normal positioning for defecating, and just overall knowing how to manage and prevent these issues of elimination from occurring or worsening, and who's at the most risk of developing these um, disorders. All right, so let's move on to irritable bowel syndrome, which is a chronic functional disorder and it's characterized by recurrent abdominal pain associated with disordered bowel movements. And these can either be diarrhea or constipation or both without any identifiable cause, so fun. Um, and this syndrome, it's pretty common as well. About 11% of people worldwide have it. Um, Women are more often than men to get this, um, unfortunately, but there seems to be a complex interplay of like genetics, environmental, psychosocial factors associated with IBS, and then um, the exacerbation of their symptoms from stress, sleep deprivation, neurohormonal dysregulation, which I can see why it would occur more in women, um, bacterial overgrowth, surgery or infections, but really the cause of irritable bowel syndrome is still unknown. There needs to be a lot more research done. So symptoms can vary widely and range in intensity and duration from mild and infrequent to severe and continuous. And they classify IBS into types. So you have IBS C or IBS constipation, and then we have IBS D for diarrhea. So clients will complain of abdominal distension, bloating, pain, and changes in their bowel patterns. Um, the abdominal pain is sometimes relieved by defecation, and it usually occurs in conjunction with other disorders such as GERD, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, just to name a few. Um, diagnostically, this is diagnosed by excluding other diagnoses. Um, there's no specific test to perform to tell us if this is actually IBS. We just have to rule out everything else um, before they can, can conclude this is irritable bowel syndrome. So medical and nursing interventions. So the nurse's role in IBS is really to mainly provide the client with information and education and then encourage self-care activities like the use of bowel habit diaries and a Bristol stool form scale, um, so which probably many of you have or used or seen in clinical this semester. So emphasizing good sleep habits and good dietary habits like avoiding foods the client knows will trigger IBS symptoms, avoiding fluid with meals because this adds to abdominal distension, discouraging alcohol and tobacco use again, um, encouraging stress reduction techniques like yoga, maybe cognitive behavioral therapy or exercise. And then pharmacological interventions, loperamide, um, which is used to slow down the GI tract for diarrhea. Um, we can give them antispasmodics like di um, diclo... Dice. Why can't I say these words? Anyway, um, dicyclomine. Yes, I did it. Okay. Um, if the client with IBS complains of a lot of abdominal pain, um, antidepressants may be prescribed to treat 
um, the underlying anxiety and depression that might affect serotonin levels and modulate intestinal transit time. So this might improve abdominal discomfort. And then your book also mentioned introducing probiotics that can help decrease abdominal discomfort with bloating and gas. So on to celiac disease. So this is an autoimmune disorder and it's in response to the consumption of products that contain the protein gluten. And gluten is most commonly found in wheat, barley, and rye and other grains like malt and beers, dextrin and brewer, brewer's yeast for things like bread. And this has been a lot more popular over the past few years where every product you see that literally never has gluten in it now says gluten free. Um, so really about only 1% of the US has celiac disease and there is um, a familial risk component, particularly among first degree relatives. And then others who are at heightened risk are type one diabetics, those with Down syndrome, and then Turner syndrome. So clinical manifestations, um, if the client with celiac disease were to com consume gluten, they would have diarrhea, steatorrhea, um, abdominal pain, a distension, flatulence, and then weight loss. Um, it's diagnosed by drawing blood work for the immunoglobin for gluten, which is about 90 um, percent sensitive and 95 percent specific to celiac and then findings are confirmed with an upper endoscopy with biopsies of the small intestine and this is a lifelong disease it's not curable um, treatment is really just to refrain from the consumption of gluten um, usually collaboration with a dietitian will be done and then clients should also be informed of how long it will take for symptoms to subside um, typically, even though they avoid gluten, they can still have symptoms occur. And unfortunately, celiac disease can cause a lot of complications such as fluid and electrolyte imbalances, weight loss, anemia, B12 deficiency, and osteoporosis that also need to be treated. Um, we can introduce medications that help with inflammation and to suppress that immune response, but really our role here is going to be providing good education on how to avoid gluten gluten. Why do I say it like that? Anyway, um, <clears throat> there's a great chart um, on in your book, 41-4, um, if you wanted to take a look on how to better educate your client with celiac disease. Um, um, but it's really probably not easy, that's for sure. Okay, so that was celiac disease and on to talking about acute abdomen also known as surgical abdomen, which is characterized by an acute onset of abdominal pain that does not have any traumatic etiology and that most typically requires swift surgical intervention to prevent peritonitis, sepsis, and shock. So things like appendicitis, peritonitis, diverticulitis, all the itises, um, obstruction, and then hernias, if they're really, um, out of control. So acute versus non-acute abdomen. So if you're triaging a client, this is how we would characterize the difference in an acute versus non-acute abdomen. And hopefully while reading through and comparing and contrasting, this makes sense to you. Um, I'm not going to read off the slide, but I will let you go ahead and look through that. And then back to our anatomy and physiology. So just knowing where in your abdomen everything is anatomically can help you to decipher what is going on with your client when they say, oh, I'm having pain on my right side under my rib, or I'm having sharp pain on my left lower abdomen. You have an idea of um, what organs are where so that you can start to conceptualize what's going on with your client. So let's start in the acute abdomen classifications with peritonitis. 
So this is localized or generalized inflammation in the abdominal cavity that can happen for a number of different reasons. So the most common being a bacterial infection. And remember we talked about peptic ulcer disease and how that can cause perforation? Well, it can definitely lead to peritonitis because now you have all of that contents within the bowel and stomach that is going into the peritoneum. Um, and we'll also talk about how diverticulitis can perforate the sigmoid colon and become peritonitis. Um, something else that can cause peritonitis is a volvulus, which is a twist in the bowel, post-op complications, um, maybe they nick the bowel, um, peritoneal dialysis, which we'll talk about more when we get to diet, diabetes, or something like a blunt trauma from a car crash or, or a fight with a bear. I don't know. I'm just thinking that might be something that could cause peritonitis for sure. Um, clinical manifestations. So a hallmark sign of peritonitis is going to be severe pain um, over the involved area with guarding and rebound tenderness. The client is not going to want you to touch them whatsoever. Um, the pain is going to be so severe that they can't even move. Um, even just walking around is going to be uh, crushing pain. So they'll have abdominal distension with a rigid board-like abdomen. And also since peritonitis be can become sepsis pretty quickly, they'll have fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, maybe altered level of consciousness, hypotension, and then perhaps they'll go into shock. Um, so diagnostics, we would definitely grab some blood work, uh, CBC to look at their white blood cell count, uh, CT of their abdomen to look for abscesses or ascites or just free fluid. And then they can go in and aspirate the peritoneal fluid to test it for bacteria if it is peritonitis. Um, and it's not needing emergent surgery, they can sometimes treat it with antibiotics. Um, sometimes, though, they will bring them in emergently and do a washout of their abdomen um, and then find the cause of the peritonitis if this is due to a rupture or per, um, perforation and then repair that. So management of peritonitis will include replacement of the client's fluids with electrolytes, isotonic IV fluids due to hypovolemia. Um, the client will definitely need pain medications, so uh, we can pro provide analgesics and even antiemetics for nausea and vomiting. They may need supplemental oxygen to promote adequate oxygenation or intubation and ventilatory assistance. Um, usually clients will be placed on antibiotic therapy, so large doses of broad spectrum antibiotics until the specific organism can be identified and then appropriate antibiotic therapy can be initiated. Um, really, we want to identify and control the source of infection and then stabilize the patient as best we can. So here's a great picture just really summarizing everything we just discussed, and it looks like one of the concept maps I draw on the board. So this might be helpful for those visual learners who, who want everything in one slide or one piece of paper. So here's the management and the nursing priorities for diverticulitis. Um, we want to put the client on immediate bowel rest so that we are not going to do any more damage to that GI system. Um, they'll probably go on some IV fluids and antibiotics. And once that acute phase of pain and inflammation is settled, we can go ahead and start introducing them to a diet and increasing their activity and encouraging hydration. So six weeks after um, the symptoms have resolved, patients will undergo a colonoscopy and this is to assess the extent of the diverticular disease. Um, if a patient has reoccurrence of diverticulitis, surgical consult for a colectomy might be done to remove the part of the bowel that has been damaged by the diverticulitis episodes. Um, or they might have a colectomy during the acute phase if obstruction or other acute situations exist, um, like perforation. So they might end up with a tempor temporary colostomy until the bowel can heal, or they might end up with a existing colostomy um, for the rest of their lives. So 
diverticulitis increases the patient's risk for perforation exponentially. So the more episodes, the more risk of perforation and then um, more risk of having a colostomy or an ileostomy sometimes. So a lot of what we're doing as nurses um, is going to be education and then administering fluids and talking about their diet, um, maybe administering antibiotics, um, educating them about medications and the follow-up plan, and then pre and post-op if they do end up having a colectomy. All right. So on to bowel obstruction. So a bowel obstruction is when a blockage is preventing the normal flow of intestinal contents through the intestinal tract. And this can either be from mechanical, um, maybe adhesions, hernias, abscesses, tumors, or strictures. And then we can also have functional or paralytic obstruction where the intestinal mucosa cannot propel the contents along the bowel. And this can be because diabetes, neurologic disorders like Parkinson's, or during bowel surgery, um, like the bowels are just starting to wake up again, um, and they're not able to propel those contents um, in a normal way. And then a bowel obstruction can either occur in the large or the small intestine and be partial or complete obstruction. So clinical manifestations um, for a small bowel obstruction, initial symptoms can be cramping pain, and this is a wave-like and colicky pain. And it's due to that persistent peristalsis that is above and below the blockage. Um, the client may pass blood and mucus, but no fecal matter and no flatus. Um, so vomiting can occur, and I've seen patients vomit stool before, um, not fun. Uh, definitely need an NG tube. Um, and then watching out for dehydration because that can occur. And you'll see symptoms of extreme thirst, drowsiness, oliguria, malaise. The abdomen can become distended. And in extreme cases, we may see the person go into hypovolemic shock. <clears throat> so for a large bowel obstruction, it's going to be a slower onset of symptoms. And we might only see clinical manifestations of constipation. Um, but there can also be weakness, weight loss, and anorexia. And then eventually the abdomen will become markedly distended. So diagnosis of bowel obstruction is really based on symptoms and imaging, blood work, and physical assessment. Um, bowel sounds may be high-pitched and hyperactive above the obstruction and then um, quiet below the obstruction. So changes in bowel pattern will definitely be noticed, and that's why we ask our patients when was the last time you had a bowel movement, and we monitor that um, throughout their hospital stay. Um, abdominal x-ray and CT will show abdominal um, quantities of gas, fluid, or both in the intestine, and sometimes um, we'll see a collapsed distal bowel. Labs like electrolytes will show dehydration, maybe possibly infection. And then management is really just de decompressing that bowel through the insertion of an NG tube to suction for all patients with small bowel obstruction, which this can result in the resolution of the obstruction. And then if that is not an option or if, if it's not working, then sometimes surgery is needed. Well, they'll, they'll need to remove some of that affected bowel and the patient may need a, a colostomy um, or an ileostomy. But that's really dependent on the situation. So nursing care priorities. Um, in either case, we usually put an NG tube down someone's nose um, to help decompress that bowel. We'll be giving them IV fluids with electrolytes, um, making them strict I's and O's, probably needing antibiotics, we might place a catheter um, just to monitor those eyes and O's more closely um, and obviously monitoring their labs to assess for any infection, electrolyte imbalance, nutritional concerns like albumin levels, um, monitoring their vital signs, um, any pain, doing good oral care because their mouth is going to be very dry. Um, and if they're NPO, they're 
they're needing good mouth care. Um, and then talking to them about nutrition and make sure um, their nutritional status is uh, being monitored. All right, so onward from bowel obstructions to ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So both of these are inflammatory diseases of the bowel, but they have different pathologies. So with ulcerative colitis, it's confined to the colon and it affects the superficial mucosa, where that inflammation creates ulcerations and shedding of that mu mucosal lining. So you'll see manifestations of diarrhea with blood or pus or mucus, and then they'll be at risk of um, developing perforations. Um, with ulcerative colitis, since it is confined at the colon, if we go ahead and perform a colectomy, then we can cure it. Whereas in Crohn's disease, it can occur anywhere in the GI tract from the mouth to anus, so we can't cure it. Um, and then if those with ulcerative colitis choose to get a colectomy, then they'll need a colostomy. So considerations to think about when they're making that decision. With Crohn's disease, like we talked about, it can occur anywhere in the GI tract, and so we'll see a cobblestoning effect, which I'll show you in a picture on the next slide. Um, and this is because the client will have inflammation that develops into small focal ulcers that deepen into the mucosal layer into longitudinal and transverse ulcers, and these are separated by edema. So that's how we get that cobblestoning effect. Um, Fistula strictures and abscesses, perforation are pretty common, as well as exacerbations and remissions for Crohn's disease. So here's a picture of that cobblestoning you'll see within the bowel mucosa. Um, and this is toxic megacolon, which occurs in ulcerative colitis. And as you can see, the colon is widely enlarged. And this happens when swelling and inflammation spread into the deep layers of your colon. And as a result, the colon stops working properly and it widens. And as a result, it may rupture. So symptoms of toxic megacolon include fever, abdominal pain, distension, vomiting, and fatigue. And diagnosis is made via x-ray or CT of the abdomen. Um, so medical management involves placing an NG tube again for decompression, IV fluids and electrolytes, corticosteroids to decrease inflammation, and then antibiotics. Um, sometimes a total, a subtotal colectomy or a total colectomy may, may be performed, but depending on the severity of the situation, but this is a complication that occurs in ulcerative colitis, toxic megacolon. So symptoms for ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's. So with ulcerative colitis, we will see bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Um, they might have mild, moderate, or severe bloody stools with or without fever, malaise, and anorexia. Um, we'll probably see anemia when we're monitoring their complete blood count. They might have tachycardia, tachypnea, and dehydration as a result of this bloody diarrhea, especially if it's severe. Whereas in Crohn's, we have diarrhea and colicky abdominal pain, which is common, um, but they don't have as many stools as ulcerative colitis. Um, <clears throat> with Crohn's, we'll see weight loss from malabsorption and dehydration is a common issue. Um, we can have frank red blood, but it's much, much less likely than ulcerative colitis. And then with both, they are chronic mild to severe and unpredictable with their acute exacerbations. With ulcerative colitis, we just talked about one of the complications, which is toxic megacolon. Um, they all, they are both at risk for hemorrhage and perforation and peritonitis, but um, ulcerative colitis, um, well, they're both at risk for cancer. Um, with ulcerative colitis being colon cancer, and then with Crohn's being small intestine cancer. And then just general systemic complications, they're both at risk for dehydration and electrolyte balance, but mostly with Crohn's, um, we're adding malnutrition. Um, because again, it affects the mouth to the anus, so um, a lot of absorption issues, um, especially affecting all um, areas of our GI tract. 
So diagnostics. Um, with both of these, it's really essential to rule out other disorders. Um, so early symptoms of both of these can really mimic conditions like IBS, especially Crohn's. Um, for ulcerative colitis, they'll perform some abdominal x-ray studies, and these are looking at different views. Um, and then they'll go ahead and do a colonoscopy, which is the definitive screening test for um, distinguishing alter ulcerative colitis from other diseases, since they can directly visualize the colon. <clears throat> and biopsies are typically taken while performing that. They may also perform CT and MRI scans to visualize for any abscesses or perirectal involvement. Um, we'll definitely be doing a complete blood count, electrolytes, um, looking at albumin for malnutrition, um, ESR, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which shows uh, elevation um, of chronic inflammation. Um, if it is elevated, it reflects chronic inflammation, is what I meant to say. Um, we can do stool cultures um, for both, which we're looking for ova and parasites, so eggs and parasites. And then we'll also look for a white blood cell count, blood and pus in the stool. And then we can go ahead and do a sigmoid um, colon or a colonoscopy sigmoid endoscopy or colonoscopy for Crohn's. Um, they might end up doing a barium enema um, or even a capsule endoscopy, which I'll have a picture on on the next slide. And then for both, we'll probably take um, biopsies. So this is a capsule endoscopy where, um, we, so the capsule is actually um, a pill camera. And in the bottom right, picture is what that camera is visualizing. So this is great for Crohn's disease um, because again, we said it affects mouth to anus. So they go ahead and swallow this pill. Um, it makes its way down through the GI tract and we have a whole video on the entirety of their GI system, which is great. So we want to be making sure that um, we retrieve that. Um, actually, no, we don't have to retrieve that pill. Um, what they do is they put um, a little um, band on their stomach that um, wirelessly like records the pill cam um, and then they just dispose of the pill cam right after. Um, and take the recording from the belt that they wear around their abdomen. So really cool. Um, so here's the medications for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. So typically the first line treatment is the amino salicates, and these are for inflammatory bowel diseases because they decrease inflammation directly in the bowel, and they're typically more effective in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's. Um, sometimes clients have um, an oral intolerance um, because these can cause uh, orange or red urine and skin discoloration. They can also induce photosensitivity. And then some common side effects include nausea and diarrhea and headaches. With antimicrobials, so some select clients with perianal fistulas um, with inflammatory bowel diseases, um, we can go ahead and just treat them with antibiotics as a first line treatment for the infection and prevention um, of those. But um, obviously with antibiotics, we're looking out for side effects um, like C. diff or with metronidazole, we're looking for peripheral neuropathy, um, which would require um, instant discontinuation. So we want to be educating our clients with that. And like I said in the beginning of the lecture, we also want to warn clients not to drink any type of alcohol when they're on that um, antibiotic because of the toxic interactions that it can create. And then corticosteroids, these are used to decrease inflammation. They can be systemic, um, like prednisone or methylprednisolone. Um, they can be topical, like hydrocortisone, um, suppository or enema. Um, so 
what we want to remember here is that tapering off of corticosteroids is going to be important. Um, clients won't be on these long term because they can inhibit wound healing, which is something that we don't want to do, especially with inflammatory bowel diseases. And then immunomodulators, these are helpful to suppress their immune response. Um, they're not used for acute treatment, they're kind of used for chronic treatment. Um, these require CBC monitoring um, because they um, patients can develop bone marrow suppression and um, potentially inflammation of their gallbladder and pancreas. And with methotrexate, that is really Crohn's specific. Some side effects to look out for is flu-like symptoms, bone marrow suppression, and liver dysfunction. So monitoring their um, complete blood count, LFTs, and these medications aren't, aren't given in pregnancy. And then lastly, we have biologics and targeted therapy. Um, so these help to create antibody formation. Um, they are really expensive. Some side effects include upper respiratory infections, headaches, nausea, joint pain, and then more serious, which is reactivation of tuberculosis. If they have um, underlying tuberculosis, this can be reactivated by this medication, hepatitis, um, some cancers or opportunistic infections, um, because really these are um, decreasing um, the immune response. And I just want you to know the monoclonal antibodies, the term monoclonal means man-made. So this is a man-made antibody um, and it's synthesized from a cloned immune cell. Um, so it really is just binding to an antigen and these attack um, normal tissues in people with autoimmune disorders. So treatment of inflammatory bowel disease, um, like we talked about, sometimes it end up, well, we end up going surgically um, when bleeding and perforation or obstructions, fistulas, abscesses aren't responding to treatment and the symptoms are worsening. So patients with Crohn's, um, about 75% will end up requiring surgery and then with ulcerative colitis about 25 to like 40% um, will end up having um, either a colostomy or an ileostomy. And so in the acute stages of um, an exacerbation for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, what we really want to be thinking about is bowel rest controlling the inflammation, fighting infection if that is um, the cause, correcting any malnutrition um, and hydrating them, um, replacing electrolytes, reducing their stress and relieving any symptoms like of pain, um, and then optimizing their quality of life. So clients with inflammatory bowel diseases who end up becoming malnourished, they may require parenteral or enteral nutrition. So it's important you, you review these concepts you learned in Adult Health One. So things like what nursing considerations you need to have prior to administering parenteral nutrition, um, what complications you need to be monitoring for, expected and unexpected outcomes, um, how to recognize whether your client is tolerating these or not tolerating these well, um, things like that. And then the chronic management um, is education. So if they have any knowledge deficit about their medications, their disease management, we need to be talking to them about this. And then of course, self-care, which is um, malnutrition is a huge problem. Um, so we need to assess the client's ability to care for themselves. So ostomy care, I know we talked about this at the beginning of the semester when we did a skills lab. Um, so since these clients may end up 
um, needing ostomies, we need to talk a little bit about ostomy care again. So um, complications are definitely going to be important here. Um, complications are more likely with an ileostomy than a colostomy, um, especially skin integrity, um, because it is more watery. Um, so it's more likely to leak um, and then cause um, skin integrity issues. Um, we can see things like dehydration, hypokalemia, maybe GI bleeds. Um, the dehydration and hypokalemic can then lead to cardiac arrhythmias. Um, appliances may need to be changed um, more often, but usually every five to ten days, um, and then emptied every four to six hours on average, maybe more often depending on the client. Um, talking to them about diet and what they can um, consume and maybe not consume when it comes to ostomies and then irrigating. We really don't want to irrigate um, in clients with Crohn's or diverticulitis, diverticulitis um, or those receiving chemotherapy because they're at risk of perforation. But um, sometimes we can irrigate the stoma to help empty colon gas or mucus and feces. And then lastly, anorectal disorders. So here are some anorectal disorders and their definition. Um, maybe you know some of them, maybe you don't, but we did kind of talk about, um, I just wanted to include these because these are sometimes seen with those inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, and then I just wanted to include some pictures at the end And those are, and that is it. All right, well, that was good. Um, I will see you in class. And if you have any questions about this lecture in particular, just send me an email.